The American Story, The Beginnings by David Barton and Tim Barton as read by Carl Hirsch. The American Story highlights some of the interesting moments and people that revealed God's providence in America. We have a fascinating history that must be remembered and passed on to future generations. Section 3 The American War for Independence Chapter 4 The Committees of Correspondence, 1772 Chapter 5 The Boston Tea Party, 1773 As well as Chapter 6 The Intolerable Acts of 1774 The Committees of Correspondence, 1772 As noted earlier, in the years leading up to the War for Independence, the 13 colonies had been highly independent from each other. There was therefore no consistent system of communication between them. But when the tensions between Britain and America first began to escalate in 1766, the Reverend Jonathan Mayhew of Massachusetts proposed the use of circular letters to help unite the colonies in thinking and action. He died before his proposal could be implemented. But Samuel Adams, the, quote, father of the American Revolution, end quote, made his idea a reality in 1772. Adams believed that the British government had violated the colonists' rights as individuals, citizens, and Christians. The conflict between the colonies and England, therefore, was not just political and economic, but also spiritual. Adams understood that a knowledge of their rights in each of these er three areas must be known and appreciated. To help achieve this unity of ideas and principles, Adams proposed that committees of correspondence be established in every colony. Each would set up communication with the others, reporting to the rest what was occurring in their state. They would also provide materials that could be shared to help educate and alert citizens in every colony to the common principles for which they were all fighting and the actions each should take. Many responded enthusiastically to Adams' proposal. However, one patriot who supported the effort lamented that some may not join because, quote, they are dead and the dead can't be raised without a miracle." End quote. But Adams disagreed, replying, quote, All are not dead, and where there is a spark of patriotic fire, we will enkindle it. End quote. Adams, Sam Adams' plan moved forward, and he personally wrote the first circular letter. It clearly set forth the biblical basis of their endeavors calling on Americans to study, quote, the institutes of the great lawgiver and head of the Christian church, which are to be found clearly written and promulgated in the New Testament, end quote. It is not surprising that Adams should say this, for like most of the founding fathers, he was a strong Christian, openly declaring, quote, I rely upon the merits of Jesus Christ for a pardon of all my sins, end quote. Famous historian George Bancroft further affirmed, Samuel Adams was a member of the church. Evening and morning, his house was a house of prayer, and no one more revered the Christian Sabbath. The austere purity of his life witnessed the sincerity of his profession of Christianity. The Boston Tea Party, 1773. Massachusetts, having its legislature dissolved by the king and its citizens shot down in the Boston Massacre, closed its ports to British trade ships. The British Parliament responded by repealing portions of the Townsend Tax, eventually repealing all the taxes except that on tea, one of the most popular drinks in America. The Americans continued to object to being taxed without their input, so they simply refused to buy any tea 
upon which the tax had been placed. As tea sales plummeted, tea piled up in warehouses in England, tea merchants asked the British government to intervene. Without opposition, Parliament voted to subsidize, that is, underwrite, the cost of the tea by lowering its price and making it cheaper than any tea that the Americans could purchase elsewhere even through smuggling. Although the Tea Act slashed the price, Great Britain still kept the previous tax on the tea, believing that the colonists would surely buy it and thus pay the tax if it were cheaper than the other alternatives. Benjamin Franklin knew better. He pointed out that the Americans objected to the principle of unjust taxation, not the price of the tea. So even if the tea were cheap but still had the tax, the Americans would stand by their principles and not buy it. He was right. Americans refused to purchase even the inexpensive tea. Infuriated, Britain decided to force the Americans to buy it. As early historian John Fisk reported, Lord North, the British Prime Minister at the time, said, it was of no use for anyone to offer objections, for the king would have it so. The tea was ordered to be sent to America. Americans would pay for it, and there would be no opt-outs. The Patriots in the seaports, where the tea ships would arrive, held town meetings to decide what to do. When one tea ship docked in Boston, the Patriots put guards on the craft. Its tea was not to be unloaded. But that decision put the ship's owner, Joseph Roch, in a very difficult situation. He wanted to explain his dilemma to the Americans, so Patriot leaders called for a public meeting at Boston's Old South Meeting House. Approximately 7,000 citizens came to hear him. He told the crowd that if he attempted to sail back to England without unloading the tea, his business, and perhaps even his life, would be in danger, for the British had threatened to seize and confiscate his ships unless the tea was offloaded by a certain date. The colonists sympathized with his predicament and came up with a solution to deal with the hard-fisted British policy and at the same time protect Roch's business. The Americans would board the vessel and throw the tea overboard. The ship would then return to England without the tea. But at the same time, the Americans would remain true to their principles by not accepting the tea. In their eyes, it would be a win-win situation. To protect those boarding the ship from British reprisals, they disguised themselves as Indians. Early historian Richard Flem Frothingham reported, the party in disguise, whooping like Indians, went on board the vessels and warning their officers and those of the custom house to keep out of the way, unlaid the hatches, hoisted the chests of tea on deck, cut them open, and hove, or dumped, the tea overboard. They proved quiet and sympathetic workers. No one interfered with them. No other property was injured. No person was harmed. No tea was allowed to be carried away and the silence of the crowd on shore was such that the breaking of the chests was distinctly heard by them. Quote, the whole, Governor Hutchinson wrote, was done with very little tumult, end quote. This event, which occurred on December 16, 1773, became known as the Boston Tea Party. Similar but less famous tea parties were also held in other cities, including Philadelphia, Charleston, New York, and Annapolis. When word of what the colonists had done arrived back in Great Britain, members of Parliament and the King were furious. They retaliated by passing a series of acts that they referred to as the Coercive Acts, but which Americans called the Intolerable Acts. Among them was the Boston Port Act, which stipulated that beginning on June 1st, 
1774, the British Navy would blockade and completely close down the harbor in Boston, thus shutting off all commerce to and from one of America's busiest seaports. This would cut off the Bostonian supplies and starve the townspeople into submission. When Boston's committees of correspondence informed the other colonies what was happening, wagon loads of food and supplies began rolling in from across the country. Furthermore, throughout the state, it was mentioned, the day was widely observed as a day of fasting and prayer. The manifestations of sympathy were general. Businesses were suspended, business was suspended, bells were muffled and tolled from morning to night. Flags were kept at half-mast, streets were dressed in mourning. Public buildings and shops were draped in black. Large congregations filled the churches. Virginia joined Massachusetts in calling a day of prayer. Thomas Jefferson was among those who penned Virginia's State Prayer Resolve, which called on the legislature and the people to, quote, implore, implore the divine interposition to give us one heart and one mind firmly to oppose by all just and proper means every injury to American rights, end quote. Now on that designated day, the members of the Virginia House of Burgess assembled at their place of meeting and went in procession with the speaker at the head to the church and listened to a discourse, a sermon. Never, a lady wrote, since my residence in Virginia have I seen so large a congregation as was this day assembled to hear divine service, end quote. The preacher selected for his text the words, Be strong and of good courage, fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Deuteronomy 31.6 The people, Jefferson says, met generally with anxiety and alarm in their countenances, their faces. And the effect of the day through the whole colony was like a shock of electricity, arousing every man and placing him erect and solidly on his center. End quote. These words describe the effect of the Apport Act throughout the 13 colonies. The intolerable acts united the colonists and encouraged them to work together to protect their rights. John Adams spoke of the miraculous nature of this new unity, explaining, quote, Thirteen clocks were made to strike together a perfection of mechanism which no artist had ever before effected, end quote. An old clock shop filled with various wind-up clocks never sounds all the bells and chimes in unison, but this time it was different. This external union of the colonies came about because of the internal unity of ideas and core biblical principles sown into the hearts of the American people by its leaders, families, schools, churches. The Latin phrase on our national seal reflects this Christian union, e pluribus unum, out of many, one.